If you were out and about today, you may have noticed an even more distracted general public than usual as the impeachment inquiry moved from behind closed doors into homes, offices and cars across the country. And the two sides laid out their case. What we will witness today is a televised theatrical performance staged by the Democrats. Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Kent, the Russia hoax has ended and you've been cast in the low rent Ukrainian sequel. If we find that the President of the United States abused his power and invited foreign interference in our elections, or if he sought to condition, coerce, extort, or bribe an ally into conducting investigations to aid his reelection campaign, if this is not impeachable conduct, what is? When it came to the actual testimony, most of what we heard from career diplomats Bill Taylor and George Kent was what we already knew from their previous testimony transcripts. Mr. Kent, is, is pressuring Ukraine to conduct what I believe you've called political investigations a part of U.S. foreign policy to promote the rule of law in Ukraine and around the world? It is not. Is it in the national interest of the United States? In my opinion, it is not. The odd push to make President Zelensky publicly commit to investigations of Burisma and alleged interference in the 2016 election showed how the official foreign policy of the United States was undercut by the irregular efforts led by Mr. Giuliani. I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with the political campaign. But Taylor, who serves as acting ambassador to Ukraine, did reveal some new information about a phone conversation he was just told about, which apparently happened the day after Trump's phone call with the president of Ukraine. Following that meeting, in the presence of my staff, at a restaurant, Ambassador Sondland called President Trump and told him of his meetings in Kyiv. The member of my staff could hear President Trump on the phone asking Ambassador Sondland about the investigations. Ambassador Sondland told President Trump the Ukrainians were ready to move forward. That's the same Ambassador Sondland who revised his original closed-door testimony to admit he did deliver a message of quid pro quo to Ukraine, and the same Ambassador about whom Trump said, quote, I hardly know the gentleman. But while every, just about every news station in America was broadcast in the hearing, where were the eyes of the man who's usually glued to the TV screen? I did not watch it. I'm, I'm too busy to watch it. It's a witch hunt. It's a hoax. I'm too busy to watch it. Well, I watched it, as did my two guests, former U.S. Attorneys Don Stern and Michael Sullivan, who were appointed by Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, respectively. Don and Michael, it's good to see you both. Thank you. Let me start with you. Uh, these Pelosi and Schiff essentially did today what you guys used to do for a living, present a case, have opening witnesses, that sort of thing, just obviously in a very different venue. What do you think of their choice of the first two witnesses, Michael? Well, first off, it's not exactly what Don and I used to do, because obviously we follow rule of law. We don't do press Good point. statements afterwards. We're not looking for, you know, political spin. Uh, we're uh, seeking justice. So obviously, they weren't seeking justice. They're trying to seek a particular outcome consistent with their position since the day that President Trump got elected. In terms of their choice of witnesses, I don't think it's any big surprise in terms of their choice of witnesses. They're choosing witnesses they think are going to be helpful with regards to the spin that's more important to them than the facts. You know, it seems to me the good part of the choice, Don, was that they completely couldn't attack their credibility, nor did the Republicans attempt to. However, uh, one, they had no direct knowledge at all, first-hand knowledge of what the president knew or didn't know or said, uh, other than this, I guess it's second-hand, this phone call from, that a staffer was allegedly privy to, and, and they weren't on the phone call. So it seemed to me it was a rather odd choice in light of the fact that it seems to me day one is when you want to grab the American public. Was it an odd choice well, to you? Not really. I, for this reason, I think you want to start with witnesses who have clear credibility, who are career people. Both, both ambassadors have that, you know, uh, military background, uh, diplomatic corps. And, and, you know, you've got to be careful that, you know, you don't tell the entire story with one witness or two witnesses or three witnesses. You want it to sort of, you know, be, be kind of played out a little bit. So to me, it was a, it was a pretty good choice. Um, you know, and, and, and you seem to be somewhat hesitant. What's well, well, pretty about it? You know, the, the fact that there were no, what I want to say is the fact that there were no firsthand. Now, we'll see how it plays out. The irony was. Well, Yovanovitch on Friday doesn't have first It's I not until Lieutenant well, Colonel Vinman shows the, up next the, week. The irony here is that those who have first hand knowledge refuse to come and testify. So Except the, for Vinman. 
Except then for it was on the call. But, you know, the, 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 the chief of staff, the vice president, the president himself, those who might have first-hand knowledge, people from the, uh, who held up the money, they aren't, they aren't there to testify. You know, I'm going to make an analogy uh, back to what you used to do, and you can tell me it's not, is something happens and you're not quite sure if you're watching a trial, what is going to go with that. And when I heard uh, 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 Taylor today talk about that conversation a staff person was allegedly privy to between some and the president, you know, yeah, it's new information, but it's still secondhand. And I thought about it later in the day, and it was what I said a minute ago. I assume they will later talk about the fact that the president says, I hardly know the gentleman, and there apparently is evidence that he was on the phone with him talking, asking about the investigation. He did know the gentleman quite well, apparently, no? Well, I don't know if you can assume just because he's on a phone call with the president of the yes, United States. Yes, I mean you have to look at this particular president's and, and his accessibility and candidly his transparency. Most people whose intent it is to commit a crime is are not going to allow a lot of people to witness that. Here you have complete transparency on the part of the president. He has both career people, political people, staff that are witnessing kind of the dialogues that's taken place. His position all along has been there was no quid pro quo. I wasn't holding up funds for the purposes of conducting an investigation. Even though he did. And well, he, he pretty much he keeps saying read the transcript in capital letters this right, morning he tweeted right, it. Right. I have read the transcript. I assume you two have too. But, it's almost the whole case in his own words on that phone call, Michael. But it's not it's not a quid pro well, quo well, with regards yeah. to I'm gonna release the funds if you do, how is it not? Pay. How is it not a quick Because program? it's not. Because it's it's not there at all. The funds were released, even absent an investigation. The fact that the president wants well, the fact to turn wait, wait, you as a former U.S. attorney would tell you, you don't have to perpetrate the act, do you? I mean, the fact that he wasn't able to have it happen, he said on that phone call, at least from my estimation. And by the way, it wasn't just the phone call that Taylor testified about today, but months of quid pro quo kind of things. He said, "You're going to get your money." Uh, when I, or as people did, you're going to get your money when I get what I want. Wasn't that clear from today's testimony? You can't quarrel with those facts, can well, you? Now you're saying his people, and I understand the president is the executive, but the fact of the matter is if some of his people made it a quid pro quo and the president didn't, the president has, has made it clear there was no quid pro quo with <laughs> regards to the funds. And the, and the transcript doesn't show that there's a quid pro quo. He should not have to prove his innocence. We as Americans don't prove our innocence. It's up to the government as prosecutors to prove the guilt. Well, is, isn't that what, what came out today, though, as I just said a minute ago, Don, is that for those who obsessed on the phone call, and the, it's not really a transcript, the alleged transcript, uh, uh, with some ellipses here and there, and it's unclear why there are gaps in this thing, uh, the, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman talked about that last week. What was effective, I thought, today on the Taylor part was that he, he detailed many instances along the way. There were not phone calls in which a quid pro quo like thing Correct. was conveyed. Correct. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I, I happen to think that the transcript by itself tells the story, but when you add to that mix, the other events around it, it's pretty clear what was going on. And I'm surprised to hear Mike say, you know, well, it wasn't the president. It maybe we don't know what the people around him. I can see this coming. You know, this is the same president who, when Manafort was charged, said, Manafort who? I hardly knew the guy. And he said the same thing about Sutherland. Who was his campaign manager? Yeah, his campaign manager. If I were Rudy Giuliani, I'd watch my back because I think he's probably the next one to go under the Well, bus. Giuliani was mentioned, America's mayor, someone called him today. I, Representative Jim Jordan from Ohio was added to the Intelligence Committee uh, for this hearing, and I think he was added for exactly this exchange. Here's a little bit of his exchange with uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and the Acting Ambassador to Ukraine. Here he is. Were you wrong when you said you had a clear understanding that President Zelensky had to commit to an investigation of Biden's before the aid got released? And the aide got released and he didn't commit to an investigation. Mr. I was not wrong about what I told you, which is what I heard. That's all I've said. It didn't happen. The whole point was you had a clear understanding that aid will not get released unless there's a commitment. So you had to be wrong. Here's my takeaway from this. I'm going to make the third analogy to a trial. So for the third time, you can tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Is there's a different kind of jury. There's a jury. The difference is the juries that you guys did your cases in front of had to pay attention, unless occasional fall asleep kind of thing. The American people are in and out and this sort of thing. I think 
that Jordan sort of misdirection plays, and I don't even mean that in a disparaging way, for the average American who is not paying close attention to every detail is a pretty effective way to get an, a, a person on the fence to say, you know, I don't, I don't know who's telling the truth here. Would you agree with that? Or sure. Not? Yeah, in terms of getting somebody to uh, back off in terms of their statements or say I'm not sure in terms of what I've already but said. But that's a f it was effective, was it not? It even was though extremely effective. Did you think it was effective today? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, they, clearly that's the Republican playbook. I mean, what they're doing, the same thing with the whistleblower. I mean, that to me is one of the most disturbing um, things that's happening as part of the, the, the defense of the president. What, that they want him outed? Well, yeah, because first of all, it's dangerous. It's contrary to law. And secondly, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it's the equivalent of somebody anonymously calling 911 and saying, there's a crime. I think there's a crime committed in, in the neighborhood. I, I, maybe I've heard some voices. Maybe I've heard from screams. The police come. They take witness statements. And, and the DA then, Michael's a former DA, then relies upon those witness statements. It doesn't matter that the, that the original complaint was anonymous, but what they're doing is they're trying to out a whistleblower, contrary to what is the fabric of American law, which is we want to encourage people to come forward to let people investigate. But last thing on this, we only have 30 seconds left. Even if it's not relevant in a classic a courtroom sense, don't you think the American people by Friday or next week are going to say, why aren't we hearing from Hunter Biden? Is that not a problem for the Democrats? Uh, I, I think what Hunter Biden did probably is a, is a problem for the Democrats, but calling him as part of this proceeding doesn't make any sense legally. Now, politically, it may play well. I don't it, know. It, it, makes, it makes perfect sense because of the president's interest in terms of foreign policy mm -hmm. and national security uh, that Hunter Biden should be testifying. Yeah. Even though when he talked about corruption, he only talked about the Bidens and the 2016 election because, interference. Well, because any, that's, any because that's what he knew no, at that point doesn't about corruption in any other country. But that's what he, what he knew at that point in time in terms of corruption in Ukraine. We got to go. Michael Sullivan, it's nice to see you. Thanks so much, Sean. Okay, yeah, appreciate okay. your time. We'll continue. If you missed any of today's hearing or just want to watch again, you can find it in its entirety on our website, wgbhnews.org. Friday's hearing will be available there as well, live and on demand. And you can also listen live on 89.7 WGBH Radio or on the GBH app.